All right, well, hello and welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us for the effectively communicating your research, creative and scholarly work workshop. My name is Navina Cetic. I'm the executive director of leadership, professional and career development here at the Graduate College. And joining me today are Suda Bella, the executive director of operations at the office of executive vice president and provost. Sue has also formerly taught public speaking here at UNLV and has coached many of our graduate students. We also have Hannah Patnod uh, joining us today. She's a PhD student in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And also joining us today is Kendra McLaughlin, a PhD student in the Department of Interdisciplinary Neuroscience. So Sue and I are going to kick us off with a presentation and then we will all transition to a Q&A with our panelists, Sue, Kendra, and Hannah at which time you are free to ask us any questions um, of our panels. So I once heard that public speaking is the number one fear amongst Americans. So in preparation for today's workshop, I looked it up and guess what? It really is. Most of us have a phobia of speaking in front of crowds, including myself. So why do I still do it? Because effective communication is a vital part of being successful in different aspects of life, including being a graduate student and a professional that wishes to advance in their career. So let's discuss today's goals. After today, you should be able to gain strategies that will help you prepare for your presentations in a way that will enhance both your confidence and your delivery. You're gonna learn how to organize and convey your thoughts in the best possible way. And you're gonna be able to better understand what audiences actually want to know about your research. So before we move on with our tips, we wanted to talk a little bit about the origins of this workshop. As graduate students, you are being trained to be experts in your fields and masters of your discipline, but you're not Necessarily being taught how to explain your studies or its importance to a lay person. We found that many students participating in events like Rebel Grad Slam, the Graduate Showcase, or the Inspiration Innovation Impact event assumed that they should sound as scholarly as possible. They wanted to get down um, into the weeds and be technical, as though these events are scholarly presentations. There's a little bit of a difference between scholarly events and campus events. So scholarly presentations are at conferences within your discipline. These conferences are a place where you can use jargon and other principles that are familiar to your audience who will be in your discipline. But campus events are designed to advance campus and community understanding of graduate education and research and why it's really important. So the audience will be educated people, but typically not from your discipline. So you wanna to speak to them like they already know what you're talking about. They're very educated, but not in your field. So today's guidance can apply to many different presentation events, but you should always adapt your presentation to the event purpose. So campus events are the Rebel Grad Slam, Innovation Inspiration Impact, Graduate Showcase, and the President's Innovation Challenge. So before I hand it over to my co-presenter, Sue, I'm gonna just discuss what we're gonna cover moving forward. First is preparation. This is probably the most important part. You will need to plan for everything, including your audience, your content and organization, and your presentation mechanics. We're also gonna discuss D-Day delivery tips and how to quell stage fright. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna discuss the coaching process that you will be a part of if you participate in one of the campus events where we do provide coaching. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Sue for the really important parts of today's talk. Thanks, Nev, I appreciate it. Uh, so let's just jump in. We're gonna to talk to right now about preparation and planning. I think all great speeches start with planning. And you I know you probably hear this a lot because everybody's saying this to you about your papers and all kinds of projects, but this is really, really true about presentations. So you need to plan for your audience, you need to plan for your content and how you're gonna organize it, and you need to plan for your presentation mechanics, which is a term that I'll explain a little bit later. But let's start right now with the audience and just kind of talk this through. So 
first, why do we speak differently to different audiences? I know it's something that's like really seems really obvious that we and because we do it intuitively all the time, we don't really think about it. But different audiences really require different styles of communication and different content and different types of language. And we really need to be careful and think about this in the public speaking context. So we begin by analyzing the event and who is attending. That's always the first step. Who's the audience and what's the type of event? Is it your colleagues at work? Is it your classmates in a course presentation? People in your discipline as a conference, as Nev mentioned earlier, an educated, but or maybe it's educated people outside of your discipline, like we see at a lot of the graduate college events. So think about that. And then specifically, we're going to talk a little, mostly focused today on graduate college events. So as Nev said, you'll be speaking to an educated audience, but they don't really have all that expertise or background in your discipline. So you need to explain it to them in this kind of like a sophisticated way, but not highly technical. So you think of your audience first, right? What does your audience want to hear? Chances are they want to know just enough from your speech to say, first, that's interesting. And second, I understand. That's interesting and I understand. So basically, that's a pretty modest uh, thing that you have to accomplish, right? It's basically an extended elevator pitch. So you want to simplify your content in your language, adjust your language so it's like you're explaining it to someone you haven't met before. So you start there, you provide very high level background and then you get a little more specific as you go along. We call it the funnel approach. You start broadly and get more specific. And then a word about jargon and why it's not your friend. Um, again, the, the folks in these presentations are real. The audience is really an educated group of people, but they don't really know the background of your of your discipline. So you want if you're going to use a jargon term, then you have to explain it. You have so it's probably you, need, you don't have a lot of time in these speeches. So you want to think about whether or not it's most important for them to know about that. OK, next slide, Nev. So now let's move on and talk about uh, planning for your content and how you're going to organize it. You see two questions here. What will I discuss and how will I organize it? Everybody has this question when they start out and everyone has a vast amount of information they want to fit in and they have to figure out a way to pare it down. Well, we have the answer for you. We call it the graduate college formula. So Nev, next slide. What has happened is over time we've begun to see that there's a, a certain pattern that works and we've, we've just taken up kind of referring it to it as the formula. It's a, it, it works best for communicating graduate student research. It starts with an attention getter and this, some of these principles you see a lot in, in good speeches overall, but there are some that are a little specific to graduate student research. So we'll talk about that. But uh, start with an attention getter, something that is amusing or interesting that connects this topic with the audience. That can be startling statistics or a, a very short story. Uh, some people are brave enough to try a joke. You know, it's like humor is always one of those things. It's kind of a fine line. You're not sure whether or not it's going to work for you. So, but something amusing to get the audience engaged. And it, it doesn't have to be amusing, like laughing, ha ha. It can be something just engaging that brings that draws them into the topic. Um, if possible, you should try to connect what's going on to the world right now uh, in this with this attention getter. So at least something people will know about, something that they are connected to in some way. Um, second step, explain why you are interested in this topic and why the audience should be as well. You are going to tell people how you got interested in this. You explain your story, a little bit about your story, about why you came to be interested in studying this particular topic. But you also have to explain to them why it's pertinent to them. So that's important to do in the second step. Number three, provide a simple overview of your area of study. This is background. So you're giving any kind of background that they need in order to understand what your, your research is. This is just a very broad overview. Number four, provide 
very simple overview of your specific project. So you've moved now from the broad topic of the background into what your specific project is. And you're gonna explain it to people sort of the way that a fifth grader, you'd explain it to a fifth grader, or maybe your grandmother, somebody who really doesn't have a background on this subject, but you, you wanna explain it to them. You know how fifth graders are, like they're curious, they're interested, they're paying attention. They're kind of a good model for any audience, really. So you want to approach it uh, from that perspective. That it's simple, but um, not not like you talk to a kindergartner, like a little tiny kid. You want to make it sophisticated enough, but you want to explain everything as you go along. Then you want to briefly, and number five, briefly explain your method and results if you have them. Some, some students we found will just explain what their planned method is and what they hypothesize their results will be. So you just wanna talk about this briefly. And again, it's getting a little more specific now, but you still don't wanna go down a rabbit hole with this. You wanna keep it simple and get right on with the, uh, the next step, which is offering a memorable closing. Uh, your transition here is something like, so once we better understand this aspect of, uh, of my field, we will be in a better position to understand this other thing that you're studying. Uh, and then this will help the world in X, Y, and Z ways. So basically you're explaining to people why your topic is important. This is all supposed to happen in a fairly short time frame, right? You've got in, um, I'd say, what do we say, Nev, it's five minutes in the graduate student showcase. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. So it's a pretty short time frame. A 3MT is even shorter. So you've got to be very brief about these things, okay? Okay, so now let's take a minute to talk about transitions. So let's stop for a second. See what I just did there? How I said, let's take a minute to stop, stop, take a minute to talk about transition, transitions. You see what I did there? I shifted my topic. There is a, a natural shift when there is a visual transition, when we go on to a new slide, but then I reinforced it with that phrase. So let's take a minute to talk about transitions. So you wanna do that as you shift on to a new topic. So also there are different kinds of transitions. Remember at the beginning of this presentation today, how Nevena talked about, uh, remember at the beginning, she said something about, we're gonna cover these things today. That's called a preview. That's always a good thing to do, but keep it very brief. A signpost is one that comes in the middle of your speech, like what I used with this discussion about uh, changing the topic and moving on to transitions. Uh, a review would come at the end where you'd hit on some of the high points of your speech. That's very good as well, especially if you're trying to teach people uh, something. Reviewing is always critically important. Don't have a lot of time, though, in your speeches for the graduate college, so you got to keep all of this very short. And uh, remember that everything you do has to be very abbreviated to fit into this time frame. And so I want to just mention briefly why I think transitions are so important. The spoken word is very fleeting, okay? If you don't understand something in writing, you can go back and read it again. You can go back over it as many times as you'd like. You don't have this luxury when you're listening to a speech. So as a speaker, you need to help your audience follow along, keep track of where you are and know what you're going to do and, and what you've done. This helps them keep going along, okay? All right, Nev, next slide. Let's talk now about a plan for presentation mechanics. And your first question is, what do we mean by presentation mechanics? Presentation mechanics basically is how it's all going to work, how it's all going to come together. Together, And I will tell you that good delivery starts here in planning how you're going to put the speech together and how all the different parts will work together. <clears throat> so you'll ask questions like, what style of delivery will I use? First, I'll tell you the answer to that question. It's extemporaneous delivery. You're going to want to use, do, use in this style of delivery, use lots of practice. So you practice a whole lot, so part of it may become uh, memorized, which is okay. But if you memorize a speech, 
you can't really adapt and shift if you forget a word, right? So in this kind of speech, you you know what the words are, but you can use a different one if you need to. You use your notes so that you can keep your place. You can sort of keep track. It's like a map of where you're going, but you're not reading it either. You want to be able to have eye contact with the audience. So it's very important that you have uh, a speaking outline. And that brings me to my next point, which is what will my notes look like? First, I want to say your notes, it will be a big mistake to use note cards. Don't use note cards. Uh, note cards have all kinds of problems. They get out of order. You can't read them well because you have to write in tiny type to understand what's there. Uh, there's no need to hide your notes. Everybody has notes and everybody, any, if you see people who are pros, they're always using notes. There are very few people who can just hop up and, and just rattle off whatever they're going to, to talk about. So you need to use what's called a speaking outline. This is where you have key phrases that help you remember where you are. They're phrases that remind you of where you are in the speech and what your topic is, but you they won't allow you to read. So they're just phrases. I recommend making the type large on your speaking outline with a lot of spacing so that you can read them easily. And then I also recommend that you staple it together at the end so that they don't get out of order. This is another flaw of note cards is that they can get mixed up or they get lost and it's just a bad idea all the way around. You want one document that is your note, your notes in the speaking outline, like something like this. OK, this is my speaking outline and I have I have notes spread out throughout. Let me just share with you what that looks like. OK, so. Phrases that will remind you of what where you're going. Don't use note cards. Can I add one thing? Sure, else? absolutely. So this is definitely the case uh, for the majority of events and speaking engagements you're going to have. There is only one event within our graduate college where you're not allowed to use notes. Oh, that's, that's right. Uh, Sorry, Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, no. no. And this is the case in, in most um, events we have, but it's just Rebel Grad Slam three minute thesis because it's so fast paced and you, you only get one PowerPoint slide in three minutes. You cannot use notes there, but for our graduate showcase or our inspiration innovation impact, if you would like to create a note outline, that's definitely fine. Okay, thank you, Neff, for bringing that up. I would for 3MT for the the uh, Rebel Grand Slam uh, Grad Slam. I would strongly recommend you just memorize that for three three minutes. Is that what it is, Neff? Three minutes? Yeah. So just memorize that. That's my recommendation for that. Um, and. I'll just elaborate just briefly here. I would recommend that you memorize it in sections. And so you have uh, devices that remind you, OK, I know what I'm going to next. That's it, it's a whole special thing. Memorizing. It's much better if you can have uh, you will have one slide so you can um, use that. They can look at that, right? You don't want them to look at that the whole time, right? Nev? but you can you can't look at your own slide briefly. OK. Um, so getting back on, on to the, the usual set of circumstances, and I'm glad to talk more about 3MT later on. Um, when you have your speaking outline, how are you gonna use that? How, how do you practice and how, how do you get ready for your speech? That's really, really important. And I will tell you right up front that I don't believe in practicing in a mirror. I don't believe in practicing in front of friends or family. I think they just end up making you nervous. I think what you really need to do is the technique that I strongly recommend is visualization. Practice while visualizing people looking back at you. Uh, imagine yourself at, up on a stage or at the front of the room and people are looking back at you and then you're looking back at them. This will help you as you are practicing. So while you practice, just envision these people looking back at you. This is a very common problem that induces stage fright is that people suddenly, you're not used to people looking at you or groups of people looking at you. It's surprising. And so when you get up there and see, you know, 30, 50, 100 people looking back at you, it's shocking. So you have to overcome that. The way to do that is to visualize it ahead of time while you're practicing your speech. That way you'll be prepared for it. Um, 
I recommend that you visual it, you, that you visualize looking at friendly faces, people who are paying attention, shaking their heads, who are encouraging you. You'll find a few of those in your actual audience. Um, it's very helpful if you can see the venue where you'll be speaking, so you can it will help you as you visualize while you're practicing. Very important if you can do that. Uh, for some of the venues, I think you might. They're pretty big venues, right? Nev is where is the graduate student showcase or uh, I cubed? Where are they now? Are they over in SEB? We we typically kind of rotate, but they, we've had them in the student union ballroom um, and in SEB, kind of bigger type of venues, or even the theater downstairs in the student union as well. Gotcha. So you will have an opportunity for these different events to do a dress rehearsal so you will get to see it then but if there's any way you can look at the venue ahead of time while you're practicing that would be super helpful all right just want to hit a little for talk for a little while now about slides what should my slides include uh, we are strong believers in simple and brief content uh, a common problem for people with their slides is they crowd in too much even for 3MT, I would not recommend crowding in a million concepts, phrases, or sentences. It's a bad idea, and we'll show you why in the next slide. Nev, can you bring up the, the slide from our, our friend Bruce Murray? So um, this slide, has, uh, this was prepared by a guy named Bruce Murray who uh, wanted to show you how difficult it is to read a badly crafted slide. You can see at the top here, uh, death by PowerPoint, too many bullet points. You see his clever little, uh, the bullets are actually bullets. Too many bullet points, more than fun, more than four is risky. Uh, too many words on a slide, nobody listens while they read. Too many fonts are unnecessary and distracting. Uh, too, same thing with too much bold italics and underlining. Clip art, really? <laughs> I think the key with clip art, it's not necessarily bad to have clip art, but just not like really old fashioned clip art. It's like try to find something kind of hip. Um, remember to use spell check. Remember, don't turn your back while you're uh, looking at your slide. If you uh, put really small text near the bottom of your screen, people can't see it. And then over on the left, bad color schemes, right? Clashing backgrounds and fonts. And you can see his, his little bit of humor there that it causes all of these horrible things to happen, right? It's just, it's just a bad idea to do any of these things. So moving on, I guess the key here is, is that you just want to have a, uh, a simple, uh, Nev, you can go to the next slide. You need to have a, you need to have very simple slides, okay? Uh, the example here that you see on this photograph may be even too complex, but uh, depends on how he's going about handling it. Try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, one little note about attribution. So we ask that, yeah, Nev, if you can point to that on the screen, that might be helpful uh, for people to see. Uh, we, have a, we, we recommend that you use small attributions uh, directly to on the bottom right of each photo, uh, just to give like uh, recognition of content that you have not generated yourself. In some instances, reference pages are okay, but nobody really stops to read them. So we recommend just putting the, the, the attributions right underneath the photo, photos in very small type. Just make it quick and easy and it's done. Um, talking just briefly, um, oh, this is, a, we've got something here left from the, from the previous, uh, previous iteration of this, where we talk about, uh, do not, what not to do on your slides. We already covered that at the bottom there, but, uh, before I get to that differences between virtual in person and hybrid, the 3rd bullet point here, let's just talk about that. Um. In person is a little more stressful and there's more to think about regarding delivery and we're going to talk about that shortly um, on virtual in virtual presentations. The difficulty here is if you're doing a PowerPoint, you can't see your notes. So you have a choice you have. You can have 2 monitors where you can look between the, the, the 2 screens and look at your your notes there or you can print out a speaking outline. And I think when I'm presenting by myself, that works best for me. So uh, you're sharing your PowerPoint and you can just look down at your notes as though you were presenting in person. Um, hybrid is basically the same as in person, but you have to worry about technology. 
um, hopefully you have, like I do in this situation, someone to help you out with the technology and advance your slides. And we've already shown you the last bullet on here, what your slides should not be. So we're, we, we left that in there, so sorry about that. Let's move on to the next slide now. All right, we're now gonna get go to the, the, the topic that everyone wants to talk about, and that's delivery. Uh, so you've done all your preparation, you've used the formula, you've, you've planned your mechanics, you have your slides, you know how you're gonna present, you've practiced, you've done all of those things, and now you have to think about delivery. Let's talk briefly about how people perceive delivery. People often think that it, you have to be this the most wonderful speaker in the world to do a presentation, and that's just not true. I will also tell you that great delivery can be learned. It can definitely be learned, and it, it comes through practice. It comes through practice before your speech, but just in giving more, more presentations over time. You'll just get more comfortable with it over time. I think that everyone, uh, to some degree experiences stage fright. I've rarely met anyone who doesn't have at least a little bit of stage fright, but you can overcome that as well. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, people aren't used to seeing a lot of faces looking back at them. And I think that that can throw you off if you aren't expecting it. And that is why I recommend that visualization technique that I discussed earlier. Very important. Seeing the venue ahead of time is also really useful. For some reason, when, uh, and, and seeing it from the perspective of the speaker, that's very, very helpful to get up there and look at like, even if you go into the room ahead of time and it's an empty, empty room, you can at least see what the room looks like from the perspective of the speaker. It helps you to visualize while you're practicing. I can tell you one of the things that used to happen to me is when I go into a room, I'd be like, wow, look at this room from this perspective. I've never really seen this before. And it's like, it can just, whatever is distracting to you, you need to plan for that. That's why I recommend the visualization and seeing the venue ahead of time. Again, it all truly starts with preparation. If you know your material and you practice and you follow the guidance, you might be nervous, but you channel it, right? You know you're, you, you prepare, you know you're gonna be nervous, but you go through with it anyway. The more you present, the more you will be comfortable with it. It's tr very true that experience does help you over time. You, and you practice your introduction a lot. This is something that's so important. If you get off on the right foot, right, your first few words out of your mouth start well, then you you build on that. You think it's like, okay, I, I've done, I've gotten through the first sentence, I, I can do this, right? So very important to practice your introduction again and again. Um, and then follow your plan. Right, a lot of this isn't the time for improv. A lot of people will like get up there and think, "Oh, I'm just going to go off and tell a little story." Well, that that sometimes doesn't work out. You have a plan. If your plan is to tell that story, then you know it's coming and you can plan for it. But it's not the time in the middle of the speech to change your mind and go off your plan. Stick to your plan. All right, moving on to general tips. General tips, it starts with preparation. I know I've said that again and again, but very important. Another little thing, get some experience with a microphone, okay? So microphones, people, you can tell someone who hasn't used a microphone before because they're kind of afraid of it. They're like, they they see it on the podium and they are the lectern and they, they don't know what they're supposed to do if it's tilted up the wrong way or whatever. You need to get some experience with a microphone so you know what to do with it. You need to take control of the situation. You need to reach up onto the lectern and pull the microphone down to your level if it's in the wrong place or pull it up uh, in, in the other context. If it's in the wrong place, you need to move it. Um, get some experience and you can get experience with microphones like holding a microphone because there are certain circumstances where that's necessary. Um, with like karaoke or rock band, right? I don't know if you know what rock band is, but it's like you can actually you can actually get some experience with something like karaoke. You just get the feel of what it's like to use a microphone. Makes a big difference. So when you're actually there and try to make eye contact, and this is good to do while you're practicing. Imagine looking at different people throughout the room on your left, your center, and to the right. So move it around a little bit like you're looking throughout the room. Uh, try to move as naturally as possible. I talk with my hands a lot, but some people do, some people don't. 
there are certain circumstances. Some people want to just remain tightly behind the lectern, the little podium you're, you're standing in front of with the microphone. If you want to stay there, that's fine. Some people want to move around, but you have to plan for that and you have to have your microphone uh, worked out, whatever that's going to be. Um, gestures, you know, make them seem natural. That's the important part is whatever you're doing needs, seems to be, needs to be natural. Same goes for facial expressions. If you're talking about something that's very sad, then you need to express, you don't need to be smiling, right? But uh, pay attention to what you're talking about. The facial expression should sort of match the topic. And then finally, uh, another general tip, don't do anything weird, right? I know that sounds kind of uh, general, but one of the things that I've seen when I was in uh, teaching public speaking, I've seen a lot of little weird things pop up where there was one guy who was playing with the change in his pocket, jangling around the change in his pocket the whole time during the speech. I've seen a lot of swaying, swaying back and forth, clicking a pen. You don't want to bring a clickable pen with you up there, right? You don't want to do anything weird. It's like it's very distracting for people. And you, but you don't want to seem uncomfortably straight either. You hope to just kind of feel natural with it, right? Kind of go with it. See if you can shake out, shake it out ahead of time. Just kind of feel like you're going to get up there and you're just going to do what you would normally do if you were talking to a friend. So, but you can plan some of these things like uh, the, the movement and so on. You just have to, to think them through and think about your microphone and the circumstances uh, around that. Uh, on the day of, on the day of the speech, I like to break this out into the day of and the minute of, because there are different considerations for each. On the day of the speech, the morning or a few hours before your speech, think about what you're going to wear. Wear the right clothes for your event. You want to wear clothes that make you feel strong yet comfortable. So think about it, and comfort is a very important thing. You don't want to wear anything that's too tight. You don't want to wear anything that you have to adjust all the time. You don't want to feel uncomfortable. You want to wear something that's easy to wear, that but that makes you feel strong, makes you feel powerful, makes you feel ready for this experience. So very important. What you wear is it, it's it's part of your it's your uniform for your event. Um, and I separate this out because it's equally important. Wear the right shoes. Um, stability and is a, is a practical concern here, especially if you have to walk up onto the stage. I've seen um, <clears throat> people wanting to wear um, very high heeled shoes. Now, if you're very comfortable in that and you know you can do it, but don't wear any weird crazy shoes that you're not comfortable in. And stability is a priority here. So um, we've seen people do that where they trip going up on the stage Right, Jennifer Lawrence did that at the Oscars one year, and it's like it just kind of throws you off and gets you off in the right, gets you off in the wrong direction. So you definitely want to have some stability there and, and be comfortable in those. Um, next, psyching yourself up. So psyching yourself up is is a, a process that involves thinking, and, and everybody has their own, thinking that you are ready for war, but you're, you realize that your audience wants you to succeed. So you're, you're psyched up, you're ready, you can do anything, you're in the right headspace for doing this, this speech. But you also realize at the same time that your audience wants you to succeed. Like how many of you have been in the situation where you watch someone speak and they're so horribly uncomfortable, terribly uncomfortable, and you feel it with them. It's just it's just human nature to feel that empathy. You're uncomfortable too. The audience wants you to succeed. Remember that as you go in. You want to psych yourself up, but at the same time, they they want you to succeed. They want you to take control and succeed. And so just keep that in mind. Another really practical tip for the day of: don't eat right before, and don't drink a whole bunch of water right before. Try to plan it out so you eat a few hours, a couple hours before. Don't drink, you can drink a little water, but not too much water. You don't want to be sloshing, right? You just want the right amount. You want to go in so your mouth's not too dry, but you're also not drinking a whole bunch of water. Um, now for the minute of your, of your presentation. 
So trust in your training and trust in your preparation. That's why I keep harping on the preparation. If you've practiced it and you know your material, you will feel more confident as you walk up onto that stage or up into the front of the room. If you do take the, the advice we've given you today, you will be ready and trust in your training and your preparation. I can't say that enough. Walk carefully and stand up straight as you go up to the podium. Don't slink in, walk up, feel strong. You're, you own this place, right? You are, you are in control. It's time for you to lead. It's time for you to take control of this situation. The audience wants you to do that. I can't stress that enough. It is your job to be in charge of this few minutes. So don't be uncomfortable taking control of that microphone or leading this group. It is your job to take control of this situation. The audience wants you to lead. And finally, know that this experience has a beginning and an end, okay? A beginning and an end. There will be other chances for you to prove that you're brilliant, right? It's like, don't, don't put too much on yourself with this. I've, you know, everybody wants to appear intelligent. Everybody wants to appear smooth. Everybody wants that. But your whole future is not probably writing on this one experience. In fact, I'll be, I'm sure of it, that it's not writing on this one experience. I think everyone has to remember this will have an ending. And you'll come out of it on the other side. If you prepare, follow your, your, your own guidance, your plan, follow your training, it'll all go fine. But remember that this is one moment in time. You will, you will be done. And then you will be able to take, breathe a sigh of relief and say that it's over. All right, Nev. I think you're up now to talk about the coaching experience. Yes, thank you so much, Sue. So as both Sue and I have touched on throughout this presentation, the Graduate College provides you with a variety of opportunities for you to be able to highlight your research, your scholarly or your creative activity to both the Las Vegas and campus community. So for select students of certain events that we host, we also provide coaching to help you prepare for your presentations. So to help you get the most out of the time that we offer, we wanted to share some tips you can implement when you're going through this process. Before your very first coaching session with us, just start with the formula that we just talked about. If you do this um, and come prepared with this for your first session, we are going to ask uh, fewer changes of you. Uh, after your first session, plan to make changes and implement the feedback that we have provided before your next coaching session. So then we can continue to give you productive feedback. And lastly, practice, practice, practice. Just like Sue said, it makes such a significant impact on your presentation if you practice between the different rounds um, of coaching sessions. We do have several events that are coming up that you should consider participating in. The first one I wanna talk about is Rebel Grad Slam because that one is the first one coming up. And uh, we did mention a couple of these things might not apply to Rebel Grad Slam, um, but the Rebel Grad Slam challenges students to a three minute one slide presentation to showcase their research to the audience and judges in a very condensed and compelling way. While we don't provide personalized uh, coaching for this event due to the volume of students that actually participate, you can implement these tips that we discussed today as you begin to prepare for Rebel Grad Slam. It's also a really great way to get exposure to public speaking and preparing for some of the other events that we talked about. When you practice for Rebel Grad Slam, be sure to time yourself as you must be done in three minutes on this one. If you go over three minutes, you're automatically disqualified. Um, you're gonna actually present in front of a panel of judges that will use a rubric to score you. And you can find this rubric on our website, but they're gonna be scoring you on comprehension, content, engagement, and communication. 
Um, so all of those are important to take into consideration. And each round that you actually advance in on Rebel Grad Slam, you will win scholarships. So we have the preliminaries, the semifinals, and the finals. And you can register to compete in Rebel Grad Slam um, by October 17th. We also have an event uh, called Inspiration Innovation Impact, also known as iCubed. And that's an event in which students from a variety of different disciplines give short five minute TED style talks or performances that showcase um, their research or creative activities. This one will be taking applications for soon and will be held on April 14th. Um, this event also kicks off the GPSA forum, which many of you will probably present uh, a poster at as well. Then we have the graduate showcase. It's pretty similar to inspiration innovation impact, but here you convey who you are, what topic you're speaking on and the broader impacts of your research. This is typically held at the end of the year so we can showcase the really amazing research um, that all of our graduate and professional students are working on. And then lastly, we have an event. Um, the inaugural year was last year, but this is the President's Innovation Challenge, and that's a team competition that really encourages um, social and business entrepreneurship to help solve problems, whether that's in Southern Nevada or beyond. And finalists will actually present together as a team. Um, they're going to present their ideas in front of a panel of judges, and this will also be an opportunity for coaching, but it will look a little differently because you are going to be uh, presenting with a team, so you will need to be in sync with your team members, um, but that will also be a coaching opportunity. So we hope you look into these events and consider showcasing the amazing work that you are doing um, at UNLV. So what we're going to do next is we're going to transition to the panel portion of today's workshop. Uh, but before we do, I do want to ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves to our audience. So I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Hannah to introduce herself. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I apologize in advance because I am actually at a conference right now, so I had to step out. So if you hear people talking and all kinds of things in the background, I apologize, but very on par for what we're talking about today. Um, so I'm a radiochemistry PhD student in my third year, but I also did my undergraduate uh, degrees in both chemistry and communication studies. And so I also do work in the rhetoric and communication studies surrounding nuclear energy. Thank you so much, Hannah. Kendra? Hi, my name is Kendra McLaughlin. I am a fifth year um, neuroscience PhD student here at UNLV. Um, my projects and what I'm largely interested in um, focuses on how glial cells in the brain affect things like movement and social behavior and how we can use um, different techniques to form better therapeutics for lots of neurodegenerative disorders. Thank you, and Sue? Hi everyone, you've already heard enough from me probably, but uh, I've worked in a variety of different uh, roles throughout the university. I have a uh, bachelor's and master's degree in communication studies, and I'm currently a PhD student in the School of Public Policy and Leadership as well. Um, I'll soon be retiring from UNLV in my professional role, but continuing my PhD work. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the screen. So we can just move on to our panel questions. So I want to start us off with actually a question to Hannah and Kendra. Can you both speak a little bit about your experience as a speaker in different graduate college events? I can take that one first. Um, so I've been able to be a part of a couple different events um, here at UNLV, one of them being the Rebel Grad Slam, and the other one is the iCubed. And I would say that each experience offered different things, but both beneficial to say the least. I'd say that for um, the Rebel Grand Slam, it's really great to have that kind of elevator pitch. Um, you tend to use that as like your calling card more often to be able to say what's important um, in your work. And then um, my experience with I3, that was really cool to be able to see um, how you can really hone in a storytelling ability through science or through creative outlets and trying to get your um, 
project or whatever you're working on to really be conveyed effectively to um, a larger community. It's not just academics that show up to that. So um, I think that both experiences help you one, create that elevator pitch and two, make it applicable to different audiences. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, the I cubed is actually where Kendra and I got to meet earlier this year. That was such a phenomenal experience. And uh, just in terms of being a, in a participant role, you get to meet these amazing other graduate students from across campus and hear about their research that you probably aren't familiar with because you're just always so um, deep into yours. And so I think that's another benefit of participating in things like this is that it kind of gets you out of your personal department where you kind of hear the same things all the time. Um, but I personally have also gotten a chance to do a virtual poster with GPSA, which was interesting. So that was actually a recorded version of your poster pitch, which is similar to like the Rebel Brad Slam. It's not limited to three minutes. It's usually like a five minute situation or so, not very hard and fast in the same way. But, um, you know, you really just kind of want to give the overview of everything that you're doing. And typically with a poster, you're able to kind of have conversations with people. So when you're in a conference setting, uh, that's obviously very different than just recorded. So, um, you know, with that being said, as we kind of exist in these like hybrid spaces, there are some slight differences that'll come up depending on if you're in person or in virtual, but I think all of them can be really effective. Um, but I totally agree with Kendra that going through the iCubed process was really phenomenal. That coaching was great, not just for that talk, but things that I've now been able to incorporate with other parts of my you know, just different talks and presentations I give. Thank you both so much. So I actually have a follow up question for both of you, and then we also have another one in the chat here. But um, can you tell us how as graduate students, can we learn about opportunities to present um, research on campus or the community? Maybe how did you find opportunities when you decided to participate? And I, maybe start with Hannah. Yeah, so I check my email, to be honest with you. There's so much that comes through, whether it's GPSA, who does pretty much something every semester, or just through the grad college, like the things that they've talked about. I just saw, because I actually take a look through, like, the weekly emails that we get and, um, you know, just kind of knowing that those are things I want to seek out. And so as soon as I kind of see like, oh, this is a thing, let me just do it and go for it. And you kind of get like this snowball effect of once you're involved, then you hear about all these other things as well. Yeah, I would definitely echo um, your sentiments. Um, your email is a great place to look websites for GPSA as well as the graduate college as a whole. Um, the updated UNLV todays often have like really well lined out um, calendars of upcoming events and deadlines and things like that. List serves for graduate students have um, different opportunities outside of Las Vegas even where um, like the WAGs, um, Western Association of Graduate Students, like things like that, they're happening all the time. You just have to put your ear to the floor and listen. Thank you so much. So we have um, a question in the chat here. How much audience interaction do you recommend to have for a conference presentation? wants to start us off on that one. I'll jump in. And, oh, go ahead, Kendra. I my experience with conference. I I, I have pre presented at a conference and uh, a scholarly conference, and my experience is is that you have a pretty short period of time, and uh, you have to run through whatever you know the the general design of your result design and results of your study. You know the the review of the literature that just basically following a publication format, more or less, and you have a fairly limited amount of time. I don't know that there's really any time built into those conference sessions to have audience interaction other than maybe a question and answer session at the end. But in my experience, what happened was I was on a panel with about five other people and they just went down the row at the table and you each had a few minutes to talk 
and then they all opened it up for questions at the end. But I'm my experience may not be representative of all all conferences. So Kendra and Hannah, please join in. Yeah, definitely those time scenarios aren't the best to maybe do like a individual kind of interaction. But in my experience, I I lean towards humor um, as a way to make the audience feel involved um, with my presentation. So, so I think one of my go to's I'm giving you guys all of my secrets. Um, I think one of my go to's is um, I'll do something like, um, oh, this great piece of protein. What is that? Great question. I'm so glad you asked and I'll answer my own question and make it seem like, oh, we're having a conversation back and forth and it kind of opens up the pathway for the audience to want to maybe ask you more questions about it at the end, or they feel like they're not just being talked at. They're here with you. If that makes sense. I totally agree with Kendra. I would actually going to say the exact same thing where. When I've been able to make the audience like laugh a little bit, even when they kind of didn't want to, it sort of like just opens up the rest of the talk. So you can just tell as soon as that like first little like, okay, this person's like not just going to be a stiff for the next 15 minutes, the audience will tend to then kind of stay engaged. Like she was saying, like you just kind of like can hook them not in the like hook way like when you write a you know thesis statement for an essay but like the actual this person is interesting i want to keep listening to them because i think especially once you start going to conferences you'll find that sessions can get really slow and you can just have talk after talk after talk and it's like okay this is interesting but i stopped paying attention like 45 minutes ago so i really don't know what's going on and so if you can kind of start off your talk by saying you know like this is what i'm doing this is why i'm excited about it now i'm going to jump into it and being you know not casual in the way that it seems unprofessional but again just in the way that it seems like you're talking to the people in the audience and having a conversation instead of trying to give a lecture because those are two very different environments um and so if you're trying to really show people how cool your work is you want it to be more of that like hook in conversation as opposed to just lecturing content because that's not very exciting. Thank you both so much. So um, it looks like somebody is asking for a Rebel Grad Slam example. So while you were chatting, I pulled up a couple of PowerPoints. I'm just going to share my screen real quick just to show you all since Rebel Grad Slam is very relevant since it's coming up. So let me just bring that up. So Rebel Guide Slime is a little more condensed because you only get one slide. So sometimes there's a little more um, information on one slide. So this is an example of one that wasn't too wordy, but you used images. Um, and we have another one here. And then I have another one to bring up. And then this is from our finals event. So I will uh, share this with you all after this PowerPoint this presentation um, in email, just so you can get an, some ideas for an example, but we do have the finals from last year on the Grad College YouTube channel where you can go and just also get an idea of how our finalists uh, put together their speeches and how they presented everything and get some examples of their actual PowerPoint slides like this one. And um, we also do have the inspiration innovation impact presentations on our YouTube channel. So I'll share these links with you all after this panel, but just wanted to bring your attention to that since somebody did ask for an example. Um, all right, so back to our questions. We do have um, somebody asking, what are some non-academic routes for communicating my work? And maybe um, Sue, if you wanna get us started in this one. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so in one of my many roles at UNLV, I was at one point in time the Director of Community Engagement for UNLV. And we were always trying to get faculty and graduate students to talk about their areas of expertise out in the community. It usually starts uh, with some networking um, and there are plenty of opportunities for that. The Graduate College puts on a lot of those events and it starts by sharing some background with someone and at an event and maybe that's the elevator pitch right that's when you give them just a little bit and they say something like wow that's so interesting i wish you'd come and talk to whatever group about this 
and uh, then you follow up and you go from there. So networking is one path toward that. I think that's that's probably um, the most obvious ones. You may have networks already from your areas of expertise or your through your um, your coursework or through your um, your just your the context of your work, you might have come into contact with people from the community who have an interest in that. But I would express interest to those people from the community uh, that you are, you would like to come out and share the findings of your research. I think that's a great idea. Hannah or Kendra, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, that's definitely one of the biggest ones I would have also said is networking. I know sometimes networking seems like there be dragons, how do I do that? But we live in a day and age where we also have lots of access to social media as well as the internet, um, LinkedIn, ResearchGate, academic Twitter. Um, there's something called Impact Story or Figshare. Uh, I think there's another one called like Humanities uh, Commons or something. All of these places are forums where people are sharing um, research data, ideas, hypotheses. People have YouTube channels of really cool work that they're doing for um, teaching purposes or just to share what they're into. So there's a lot of ways to get your feet wet kind of. Um, and I do think that earlier what Hannah says is what you'll find is there's this snowball effect where you'll get more opportunities for things. I remember after I did my um, Rebel Grad Slam um, work with uh, UNLV, um, I think it was the Natural History Museum got wind of it and they wanted me to come on and do an interview for their ologist series. And that's just for little kids. And I love doing that. So hopefully it keeps going on and on from there. I, that is so cool. Wow, that is that just experience is amazing. Um, the only thing that I would have to add is there's also room to use this skill set in things like policy advocacy. So recently I got a chance to actually go to DC and do some advocacy talking about nuclear. And no, I didn't sit down with legislators and go through my research, but I was able to do things like saying, you know, I do work with molten salt reactors. They have liquid fuels, which means no more meltdowns. They can help increase safety. They can help increase proliferation. And being able to just kind of have those sort of little, like the equivalent almost of your three minute thesis type talk, where you know you have this much time for a very high level person who could actually do a lot of good. So how can you condense all of that down to be extremely effective and nothing unnecessary? So it's kind of like yet another application of where that interdisciplinary, being able to talk to people outside of your own world can really be a benefit. Thank you all so much. Yeah, uh, Nev, let me just mention one thing too. I, and I don't, Nev, I don't think you've had this this year, but the graduate college offers a workshop on networking and what is it called networking in the cocktail speech or the elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's fun to have that conversation and get some experience with creating 1. Um, so, it's an, it's a form of public speaking really. And we'll bring that back on our workshop offerings probably within the next couple of semesters, but I think we probably have a video on that as well. Oh, Keep good. Check yeah. on our uh, YouTube channel. So I got a chat here uh, for a question for Sue. So it says, my research is qualitative in nature, specifically an ethnographic study where I was immersed in the culture I researched. What do you suggest to present in regards to information since it is not so much based on stats, but personal interviews? I'm sorry, could you reread part the beginning of that again? Yeah, so uh, the student's research is qualitative in nature. Um, so specifically an ethnographic study where she was immersed in the culture she was researching. So she wants some suggestions how to present this in regards to that information. It's an excellent question. And I think the, the answer is still the formula. Right, uh, it, it, it works for everything and I know that that sounds crazy, but I think that you are in a great position to be able to, to discuss some really engaging topics because people love to hear about other people. They love to hear stories and I think that that 
but you would break it up by you would you would still use the formula you bring you start with an attention getter that might be an, a very short uh, version of one of the stories and then you would um, talk about how you got interested in this and then you would give the background and then you would talk about how you approached your study your method and maybe some of the results and here's where you could share some of those stories and then um that would be, you know, and then you transition over to the closing about why this is important. The formula would still work. You would just have to, uh, you'd be in the fortunate position of sharing some really great content about the stories from other uh, from other people, which would is is your work, which is fantastic. So does that? I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Sue. So I know Asu already touched a little bit um, about this, but maybe Hannah and Kendra can offer a little bit more insight about what some general tips you offer on communicating work effectively. So just to kind of jump in with science communication theory, one of the things that's really hard for people to switch is this idea of when you're doing technical research, you start out with an introduction and it's super broad. And then you say, this is why it matters. And this is what I'm gonna do. And here are my results and here's why that matters. And so you kind of have this narrowing of a focus as you go from intro to conclusion. But when you are talking to anyone outside of that world, you need to start with the punchline and you need to start with, this is what I'm saying and this is why it's important. If you want some extra information, let's talk about it. Let's kind of, you know, get into it. So that kind of depends on the um, environment that you're in. So if you're doing, um, you know, like a PowerPoint talk, you can still work those types of um, paths into your PowerPoint um, and being able to just make it very clear as to what you're doing. Because if you spend way too much time on that background, they're going to be like, wait, I kind of forgot what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, that's, I'd say just kind of like making it extremely clear what your goal is at the beginning. Um, yeah, I would say in the words of my mentor, simple is complex enough. Usually when people get up to start talking about whatever their research or discipline is, they think that they have to be um, more technical and use more jargon and be more smart if that's the thing. Um, but actually what people are looking for is just, do you know what you're talking about? And can I go home and tell someone else about it? Um, so what Hannah was saying about, you know, the structure of your own talk, um, I think it honestly depends on the person. Like um, different ways are more effective for different people. So sometimes people like an hourglass shape where you start off with a hook and it's broad and you say, this is what I'm here to do. And then you end again saying, this is what I just did. Most times people are just gonna remember the beginning and the end. Um, the middle part, as I think even the best speakers have trouble getting people not to zone in and out. Um, but as long as at the beginning and at the end, you said something meaningful and impactful, you're off to a good start. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any tips on how did you kind of learn how to explain your work not with non-technical terms? Is there any type of strategies you implemented? Sometimes we can find it a little difficult to not use the jargon we're so used to using in our classes and our research labs and things like that. So this is a huge component of like, especially science communication and when not just like extremely technical words, but even words like the word trivial. I can say, you know, oh, one plus one is a trivial equation, but obviously that particular word can usually have like a negative connotation in typical conversations. And so if you say, oh, this huge complicated equation is actually super trivial, somebody in the audience who's like, I don't understand this, they might be like, I don't think that's trivial at all. But in reality, you just meant it actually has a straightforward answer. And so I don't know if this is like the best answer to that question of like, how did I learn to get to that point? But that's just something to try and do like a general evaluation of is like in the language that you use, 
try to identify what might be technical, even if you don't necessarily think it is because you've used it so much. So it's not always like the obvious terms that you need to think about, um, you know, adapting for people because you don't want to like make them feel dumb. You don't want to make them feel like they can't understand or, you know, any other type of response. You want to make them feel like, oh, this does make sense. Like I actually can grasp nuclear physics, which you totally can. It's just someone has to be able to explain it to you well enough. I couldn't agree more. I personally think that science, at least for me, in my opinion, is for everyone. And if at the end of one of my talks, if you don't understand something, I can do my job. So what I typically do is think of the audience that I'm speaking to and I pretend if there was an elementary or middle schooler in the room right now, would they be able to understand the sentence I just said? And if the answer is no, I change the sentence. You should be able to explain anything in two sentences max or less. Uh, but that's usually my rule of thumb. Sue, you have anything to add? My only thought is what I basically said in the in my earlier presentation, and that is, you know, you can use jargon, but there's a cost. And the cost is, is that you have to explain what it means in very simple terms. And so if you if if a piece of jargon is critically important to your point and you need to use it, that's all good. But you've got to take a few minutes to from the very limited amount of time you have to figure out how to explain it in a way that people can understand it. And then you can continue referring to it and people will get it, but you, you there's rarely enough time for that. So, um, so it's just, it's always weighing that out. Thank you all. So our next question here is about addressing our fear of public speaking, actually going up there and presenting. Can you share a bit about how you call your own stage fright? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so I have fun thoughts about this all the time, but honestly, the only difference between fear and excitement is your perspective. I think that those butterflies in your stomach, you can use to fuel yourself and give that energy right back to the audience. I think that it's also really comforting to kind of know that regardless of what happens during that three minutes, five minutes, 20 minute talk, at the end of it, you're going to walk away growing you're going to change and be better for it for it at some point so knowing that just take comfort in everybody gets nervous it's completely normal there's literal studies on fear and anxiety and there's a perfect amount that allows you to exceed like exceed so it's good it means that you care um, and there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of fear a hundred percent something that they talked about when i took you know a public speaking freshman year they mentioned that when you stutter, when you miss step slightly in your speech, or if you just seem a little bit nervous, that can actually work in your favor because that can sort of get the audience to not feel bad for you, like, oh, this poor person, but also like they're gonna check in because that means you obviously really care about what you're talking about because you've work yourself up and so with that said maybe kind of use that to your advantage if you're like oh maybe i sound a little nervous just know that your audience might actually be more checked that checked in than if you had just like nailed it off the bat so it's not always a bad thing and everybody's been there like nobody is going to be in the back row like snickering like oh my god you hear them they totally messed up like that's nobody's going to do that and so just keep going, just keep going. Like the longer you sit and you're like, oh, I messed up. Oh, whoops, my bad. Like, just move on. Like nobody really cares that you did a little like slight misstep. Obviously if it's like the three minute thesis, stuff like that, very different. That's like a competition, but just in a normal generic, whatever your talk is, nervousness is like a given. Like I, even for s small talks and stuff, I still kind of get like the butterflies and like sweaty hands and, all of that, just like Kendra was saying, I can sort of use that to just stay focused. And when I do actually go and give that talk, I'm just like ready because I've kind of like gotten the energy all built up. So I just use it for your benefit because it's not going to go away. You're never going to not be nervous and that's okay. I agree with everything they said. In fact, they, I think they explained it perfectly. Uh, the only thing I will, I will add, and it sort of plays off what Hannah said, is that um 
I try, I try to adopt the um, Nike slogan, the just do it, because if you just do it, then you realize you can do it. If you re if you go out and do public speaking, then you realize you can and it starts to build and you, you build your confidence and you grow and each step of the way is a growth experience. And I agree with both of them that the audience is rooting for you. The audience does not want to see you fail. That is that is just not happening. I mean, the, you've been in the audience yourselves. You know what that looks like, right? It's like you want that person to succeed because if you watch someone who's uncomfortable and really uh, terrified from the experience, you feel that. And it's such an uncomfortable experience for the audience. You don't want to put them there. You want to just take control of the situation, make them comfortable, make them happy, do what you're meant to do. And that is to speak. So um, that's the, it. It's like taking ownership of the moment and psyching yourself up just as, as Hannah and Kendra said, you, you, you channel that, that, that nervousness into I'm ready. I know what I know and I can do this. It's like um, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's feeling fear and doing it anyway. Spot on. Thank you all so much. Um, we're at the end of our time together today, but before we end today's session, I just wanted to thank our panelists for such a rich and beneficial discussion for all the great tips and strategies you provided. I hope our audience uh, got some valuable takeaways as they prepare for their speeches. Uh, before everyone logs off, uh, please take a few minutes to just fill out this workshop feedback survey I'm going to drop in the chat. Um, it really helps us as we continue to offer more workshops. Hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks everyone, it was fun.